serve you in that way. Turn in your Bibles to Hebrews 13 with me. Hebrews chapter 13. We're very much nearing the end of this wonderful journey in the book of Hebrews. We've had a great time in this. I think I say that just about every week. But God truly has blessed us as a church through this incredible piece of New Testament literature that we would study and understand this. I'm going to take a look at a few verses this morning that in fact are somewhat, uh, somewhat awkward, maybe, maybe controversial, wouldn't be inappropriate to describe them as, to some people, downright offensive. Uh, but I think this is, why, this is why we preach through books of the Bible, because it's easy for me as a servant of Scripture, as a preacher of the Word and a, a teacher of the Bible, to, to preach those passages, those portions and verses that, that I love, that are my favorite, that they kind of have those hobby doctrines that I love to preach and just kind of hover around them a lot, and I would delight to do that. But when we preach through entire books of the Bible, what it does is it it causes us as a church to come up against those, those verses, those texts, even those whole chapters that, that very much challenge us as a church. And this morning's one of those occasions where, to be quite frank, I would probably never be naturally inclined to preach a sermon like this, unless through expositional, verse-by-verse verse preaching of the Scripture, this was kind of forced on me to, to before the people of God to bring these verses to your Attention. In fact, there's a story. <laughs> there's, a, there's a story I came across in my preparation of this. While you're turning to Hebrews 13, we're going to start our reading at verse 7. We're going to read verse, three verses. Verse 7, verse 17, and then verse 24. 7, 17, and 24. <clears throat> the story goes, as it was recorded by... I was reading this, uh, this article about this particular passage of Scripture... And the the author writing the article said, I had a pastor friend of mine who said he once dared to preach on Hebrews 13, 17. Right? And if you you know what that is, the opening line is, obey your leaders and submit to them. I once had a friend who dared to preach. And he had no sooner read the verse at the start of his message, he hadn't even started preaching yet. And a woman stood up and shouted, We're Baptists. We don't submit to anybody. Whether she'd known or not that all he had done is read the line from the Bible, we don't exactly know. But there is, in fact, there is something of a proclivity of Baptists to to kind of recoil at conversation around church leadership, the obedience unto, the submission to, the honoring of God's appointment of duly ordained, biblically qualified authorities and leaders in the church. In fact, I was, as I was doing my preparation this week, I went ahead and listened to a John Piper sermon where he preached on this text, and he, he started out his sermon by making a remark saying, now I don't have really much of a right to say this, so I'm, I'm quoting John Piper just so you know. He said, he said on, on, on the one hand, we're Baptists by conviction, We believe the Bible tells us that that our our doctrinal points of of baptism being that which is given unto those who make a credible profession of faith is is what we have by conviction. And then he said, we are Americans by providence. Now at that point, I'm so glad to be living here in America. I'd love to call myself if I will be allowed an American and even more honorably a Texan. (laughs) If you'll have me. But I, but I knew, I knew, I knew that I didn't have much of a right to say it. So I'm quoting Piper. He said, okay, so, so we're Baptists by, by conviction and we're Americans by God's providence. That's what he did. And some of us came a little bit late to the party, but we came after all, nonetheless. And, and John Piper says that, that being Baptists and being Americans, those two things coalescing in this, in this repulsion, so to speak, of, of real conversation about how the Bible talks about how us as believers, us as Christians in the covenant community of faith, the church, how we relate to our leaders. And and, and so we need verses like this. We need need these parts of the Bible which perhaps impinge upon our natural inclination, our our fleshly inclination to be individuals, to be be individual to the point of isolation. Like we are self-made and we are self-dependent and we are self-sufficient and we don't need anybody else. That is entirely alien to New Testament Christianity. So we take a look at these three verses. And yes, this may be a little bit awkward. And this may, for some of us, may be quite challenging. I hope no one's going to stand up and say we're Baptists. We don't obey that part of the Bible. Because we're Baptists. We love all the Bible. And it is all God's word that speaks to us. 
and moulds us further into the image of Christ. Without further ado, Hebrews 13, 7, 17. And then we're going to take a look at verse 24. I hope you have it right there in front of you. You do? I actually don't. So let me find it. So gracious. Verse 7, remember your leaders. Those who spoke to you the word of God, consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Go down with me to verse 17. Now, just before we do that, we're not canvassing over a whole bunch of scripture because we just don't like that part. We don't, we don't really want to deal with that. We're going, to, we're going to deal with that part in weeks ahead, but we're going to try and keep this topic cemented together. So verse 17 picks up the same subject and it says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Now, as we're in Hebrews 13, let's race down to verse 24. The third mention now of leaders, verse 24, the author says, Greet all your leaders and all the saints. Those who come from Italy send you greetings. So we're going to pull these three verses together. We're going to talk about what these verses teach us, how they encourage us and, and challenge us to reevaluate how we remember our leaders, how we obey our leaders, how we submit to our leaders, and even how we, how we approach and posture ourselves before our leaders in the way we greet them. That's verse 7, 17, and verse 24. And I have to just warn you, these verses are thick and jam-packed with implication. So the first question that arises from this text, insofar as I can tell, the first question that arises is, well, who then are my leaders? Now, I have to, I have to be just really blunt and, and, and just say that the church, and by that I mean just Christian churches, wherever they may be found, and whatever stripe and color and ilk that they may take, the church tends to be something of a, of a hotbed of self-proclaimed, self-declared, self-appointed leaders of which the Bible does not mandate you listen, follow, submit, and obey. Just to be really clear. That it's not like anyone who just simply prints themselves off a name tag, staples it to their shirt, and walks around with self-proclaiming as a prophet, as a preacher, as an apostle, as a Johnny-come-lately, self-declared, appointed, whoever, they are not what is being thought of and included in this text. In fact, the author of this particular passage goes to great pains to identify for you exactly who it is you're being called to obey, submit, and remember. And that's what we're going to see right here in verse 7. We look at it again. Remember your leaders. Here's the conditions by which a leader ought to be identified. Those who spoke the word of God to you, consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. So, so your leaders who this passage of Scripture is putting upon you this burden to, 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 to posture your life in respect and honor and obedience are those who qualify through this means. Firstly, they speak the Word of God. They speak the Word of God. This is, this is what's, what, what's so compelling about the, the way we understand who leaders that we should submit to and put ourselves under as being, as being obedient to are those who take the Bible and teach it. Not people who stand up and with all great eloquence and, and articulation are able, in fact, to promulgate their own ideas and the fancies of their own imagination, but those who take the Bible and feed it to you. If they don't do that, then not only do not remember, do not obey, do not submit to them, run from them. They are not your leaders who Christ has appointed. In fact, Paul says, we're going to take a look at this text a little bit later on. In Acts chapter 20, Paul is on his way to Jerusalem and the Spirit has testified to Paul at this point in his life that he's going to get to Jerusalem, he's going to be bound, he's going to be imprisoned and he may not get out of this situation with his life intact. So he gathers the Ephesian elders and he meets with them and he says, I know, Paul wrote this in Acts chapter 20, you can read this later on. He says, I know that after my departure, Fierce wolves shall come in, not sparing the flock. Fierce wolves, not sparing 
the flock of lambs, the, the sheep of God's pasture. Fierce wolves are coming in, and then Paul says, as though it wasn't awkward enough, as he stands there challenging the Ephesian elders, he says, even from among your own selves. It's going to make it super awkward, right? Let's start looking around each other. Paul, could you just tell us? It's probably that guy. I've been, I've been really curious about his faith for a long time. Which elder is it that you think at the point of your departure as an apostle is going to raise themselves up, self-proclaimed, self-declared, that, that, kind of, that kind of self-declaration of I'm an apostle, I'm not under authority, I don't need the Word of God, I have the Word of God channeling through me without the Scripture. That person is a fierce wolf. This is why the text says, remember your leaders... Those who spoke the word of God to you. Now that's condition number one. That's not all the conditions. That's the first condition. The kind, of, the kind of shepherd, the kind of leader or elder that you should submit to, remember and obey, is the kind of minister that you see their message is not new, it's not fancy, it's not novel. It is the words of God in Scripture. That is the foundation, the bedrock of our faith. The Scripture is the final authority. It is the final judicial court for which all matters of faith and practice are to be settled before God, the Word of God. It's condition number one, those who spoke the Word of God. The next thing we find out, that, this, that the qualification of this particular leader is their faith is imitable. That's why it says, you got verse 7 there in front of you, you'll, you'll read it. It says, remember your leaders, those who spoke the word of God to you, consider the outcome of their, the way of their life, and then it says, and imitate their faith. So the kind of leader that you're being called to remember, respect, honor, and obey, not only speaks the word of God, but their life coheres with the word of God. It's not, it's not simply a message that, that resounds through the, through the words of the preacher, but it's a message that resounds in the conduct and the life of the preacher. This is, this is why it says you should imitate, imitate their faith. If you become more like your leader, if you become more like your leader, you should be growing in holiness. Now here is a great concern. There, there are many preachers, there are many pastors, uh, many leaders, not here, not in this church, not in any church that you or I know, but in other churches, let's just be safe to say, where if the congregation grew to be more like their preacher, they would be, they would be digressing from holiness. This is the great challenge of anyone who claims to be called of God to serve as a minister, as a preacher. This is the challenge that is put before us who stand here Sunday after Sunday and declare that I'm called of God to open the Word of God to deliver to you God's message. So I have to repeatedly ask myself this question. If you were to become more like me, would that mean that you're becoming more like Jesus? And if the answer is no, then my faith cannot be imitated and I would not qualify duly ordained elder, leader, preacher in this church. That's why the text says you should be able to imitate their faith. It's not the words that they proclaim only. Now, of course, proclaiming the word is essential, but is their life imitable? Is, is, there, is the way of their life something that you can see and say, if I was to become more like my pastor, Am I becoming more like Jesus Christ? Why Paul said on more than one occasion, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Now that's staggering. I, I, I don't say that without any, without any due reverence or even fear. I, I know that James chapter 3 verse 1 says, don't let many of you become teachers. Don't let the church become this revolving door manufacturing and, and pumping out pastors and preachers and teachers. Don't let the church become that because those that are teaching the word, James says, chapter 3, verse 1, they will incur a stricter judgment. In fact, Paul goes even further than this and he says to his son in the faith, Timothy, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16. Paul said this to Timothy. Take heed to yourself 
and to the doctrine, continue in them, for in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. I don't know about you, but when I read that, it's staggering to me. Firstly, you can see very clearly in Paul's words to Timothy that there is this complementary way of the word, the doctrine, the teaching, and the life. One of the Purins said it like this. He said, he said, throughout the week, many a preacher undoes a great sermon by the way he lives before his people. So Paul says to Timothy, take heed of these things. Not only the content of your doctrine, your job preacher is only half done when you stood up and taught the word. The other half of your job is to live out the word in your daily life before your people so that they can know that you not only speak the words of God, you are every bit the man of God. The ramifications of that are staggering. Staggering. What does Paul say to Timothy? If you do that, you take heed to that, you will save not only yourself, but also your hearers. There is an uncomfortable yet undeniable link. You may not want to accept this or acknowledge this, but the scripture is as plain as day. An undeniable link between the content of the word preached week in and week out and the content of the life lived of the leaders which are shepherding you and your salvation. That may not draw upon you a great cloud of fear and awe, it every bit does to me. That when I get to judgment day as a preacher, as a teacher, as a shepherd of the flock of God, when I arrive at judgment day and the Lord says to me, Craig, Where are the sheep that I entrusted under your care? Well, Lord, see, the thing is, I had all these wonderful, great, new, fandangle philosophies to preach. I had these these wonderful, worldly, new, mandated ideas that the world fed me. I read the latest books. I followed the latest latest trajectories and trends, and that's what I preach. Wonderful seven keys to a happy life and and six points to a a more wealthier existence and five points to a better-looking wife. That's the sermon I preached. None of you would need it course the Lord's going to say if you preach the word and if you live the word you would have saved not only yourself but your hearers also now let me say this with a with a fair bit of confidence that you're here by choice you're here because you volunteered to be here this morning but whoever you appoint to be over you as your leader, preacher, exegete of the word, an example of holiness unto Christ, will have a direct effect on your salvation. That's what the word says. I'm sure when Timothy first read that, he shook from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. Take heed, Timothy, to what you say and how you live. How you live. So that's what Hebrews chapter 13 verse 7 says. Your leaders are those who have a faith that is imitable, that is copyable, that is followable. If you become more like your leader, are you growing in Christ-likeness? So let the characteristics of the faith of your leader become the characteristics of your faith as well. That's what Hebrews 13 7 says. Let me give you some examples. Imitate Their love for the word. Imitate their love for prayer. Imitate their love for the church. Imitate their love for the Lord's day as God's day of which Christ is remembered in the assembly. Imitate it. Now, you can can see very clearly in that relationship who has the greater burden. You you thought, as being the congregant, you, you suspected that this would be a great burden on your shoulders, but I can assure you the burden on your shoulders is absolutely nothing compared with the burden upon the shoulders of the leader who has to live in such a way as to not even see the trace or the stain of sin in their life. To live so far from the... From the line, you, you, you know the line, where it's like you stand here and you say, I'm not technically sinning, right? This, none of you do this. It's that other church I mentioned, right? 
It's not technically sinning. And then you kind of, you step on the line and you say, well, uh, it's not technically sinning. As the leader, I can't go anywhere near that line. The burden is not upon you. The burden's on me. I'm the one that will give an account, and I I speak very personally this morning. I trust you'll give me grace to do so. I will give an account for whether you end up in heaven or hell. I will be called upon to answer for that. It's terrifying to me, as it should be, as it should be. I get up here Sunday after Sunday, Wednesday after Wednesday, to bring the Word of God to you because I have no better things to bring to you. I have no better thoughts or philosophy or new ideas. I am not that smart that I can outwit the Word of God. That's all I have. That's all I've got to give. I must live a life of holiness because I'll be called to give an account. Timothy is charged by by Paul. Take heed to yourself and the doctrine. For in doing so, you'll save not only yourself, but your hearers also. Imitate the characteristics of the faith of your leader. Let the priorities of their faith become the priorities of your faith. Their trust in the Lord, their passion, their fruitfulness, the direction they give is vision for the church. These are all things that the Scripture mandates upon you in following your leaders. And the identification of your leaders is that they would speak the Word of God The identification of your leaders is is that their their faith would be imitable. And the other thing that verse 7 mentions, we kind of skipped over it, we'll come back and revisit it, is their their life's outcome is worth considering. You saw it there in verse 7. Let me read it again. Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God, consider the outcome of their way of life. Consider it. It's worth considering the outcome of their way of life, down to the very nitty-gritty of the practice of the way that they live out Christ-likeness and and holiness and devotion to the Word and love to the flock and love to the church and love to the commission of Christ. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. And so, you ought to... So this this is kind of the theory transition to the application and so you ought to according to Hebrews 13 recognize them as leaders now the King James version some of you are using it as the phrase those who rule over you the, the Greek word for leaders there in these three different verses doesn't speak so much to an office to a to a static position but it speaks to an activity like they are, they are ruling over you, so honor them for their way of life, their way of faith, and their relationship to the Word. So what can be the response to that? We see this in verse 24. If you go back with me to Hebrews 13, we'll take a look at verse 24. Here's an important point. The author at Hebrews said to this church or these churches, greet all your leaders and all the saints. I don't know if it was obvious to you when we first read that, but this is what is clear to me. What I see clearly in the Scripture is there is a distinction. The the, the author of this great New Testament piece of Scripture says to this church or churches, greet the leaders and all the saints. There is a difference. That's unpopular. It's unpopular, I think, in a lot of churches. It's, it's unpopular in a lot of forms of Christianity. To, to see the leaders as someone who should be recognized as different, as distinct. Not necessarily see the leaders as superstars or celebrities or people who have more of the Holy Spirit than you or anything like that. But to recognize there's a biblical distinction. There's a biblical distinction between those who are biblically qualified, duly ordained in the church as leaders should receive a unique greeting. The author could have just as simply written, greet everybody, greet them all. But he made a point of separating, segregating this this category That there are those who labor in the church, who labor in the word, who labor through their life to reflect Christ and lead you in the paths of righteousness. They should be given a unique greeting that is fitting 
of their office and their position. Very simply, very obviously. That's why the scripture repeatedly says that we should recognize, or verse 7 uses a different word, it says, remember your leaders. Remember them. Recognize them. The next thing that we're commanded when we reflect upon our leaders is obey them. Obey them. Just, just simply obey what they're saying. They're there for your help. They're there for your benefit. They're there to assist you in your growth in Christ's likeness. So obey them. Two of the most awkward words you could ever say. Obey them. The Bible doesn't flinch. Simply tells you, commanded in Scripture to obey. The next thing it says, if obey them wasn't awkward enough, here you go, submit to them. Submit to them. Now let me just say this, submission is what you do when you don't like it. Just to be clear. You're not submitted if you only ever obey and follow to the exact things that you agree with. That's not submission, that's agreement. Submission is truly shown when you think, oh, I, don't like, I don't like that. I don't like how he says that. I don't like how the church is doing that. I don't like how my leaders are leading out in this direction. I don't like that. That's a silver platter opportunity to show that you're obeying the scripture to submit. Not find a bunch of friends to start having a pity party together and say, can you believe this guy? Can you believe these elders? Can you believe these deacons? Can you believe these leaders? No. Submission is the quiet, honoring, serving, especially when you don't like it. Now, of course, the caveat needs to be said that all authority in the local church is derivative of Christ. That means that your leaders, your pastor, your elders, your office bearers here in this church have no innate authority in and of themselves. None. It's all derived. It's derivative of the head of the church, Jesus Christ. That's important because what that means is your leaders can never mandate you obey them, do something that you know is against the will of Christ. Because in that moment that they do, they have zero authority. It all flows down from the head which is Christ. But to understand this, that obedience and submission to leadership is mandated in Scripture. If you're only submitted to your leaders as long as you approve, at the first sign of discontent, you're taking your bat and ball and going home, then you're not actually submitted. You need to realize that. It's not submission biblically. We take a look at a few texts. Let me read these to you. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 12 to 13 says this. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Esteem them very highly in love. But going back to Paul's letter to Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17 to 20, Paul wrote this. Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain, and the laborer deserves his wages. Do not admit a charge against an elder except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. As for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all so that the rest may stand in fear. It is a frightening office to stand in as an elder as you can hear in the text. Honor them. Double honor. Highly esteem. In love. This is the simple pattern of the New Testament. That there would be obedience and submission. Why? I, I know you don't need the why, but we're curious as to the why. right? Why, why is God so ordained that His church would, would be fashioned in this way? Why, why has God set up the structure of His community of faith in this way? Why? We have some very clear and very obvious reasons why in the text. The first one we read is, They keep watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Keep watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. So here is that moment where these two texts that I mentioned earlier, where that admonition in James 
And Paul's instruction to his son in the faith, Timothy, that these would come together in this one simple line. That, that Paul would say to Timothy, keep close watch, take special heed to your doctrine and your life, for in so doing you save not only your own soul, but those of your hearers. And then James says, to complement that, don't let many of you become teachers. This, this, this space here, this sphere, is not a have-a-go club. In fact, as a church, we should be fairly firm on, on who we allow to speak into our life and, and open the Word of God to us. You should be having the highest standards who you allow to open the Bible and speak God's Word to you. Absolutely. And I thank you that many of you are turning up week after week to give me that privilege, and yet next Sunday we'll know for sure. So this is what the text says in Hebrews. They keep watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. They're doing an incomparably important job, that is keep watch over your souls, which if you underestimate, you show just how vital they are. Because you don't know yourself. And you don't know this book sufficiently enough to know that you need godly Bible-saturated leaders. That's their job, to keep watch over your souls. God has ordained that you would have someone to keep watch over your soul. Now, I, I know there's, the, there's, that, there's that rising up of that self-sufficiency, that, that spirit of independence, right? Well, I don't need a pastor to tell me what to do. I don't need a preacher to open the Bible and teach it to me. I can have all that all by myself under a tree by the lake. No, you can't, says the Bible. And if you knew the Bible well enough, you'd know it says you can't. But you don't know the Bible well enough to know it says you can't. Ipso facto, you need a Bible teacher. That's what he's doing. That's what he ought to be doing. He ought to be standing up week after week, service after service, every time the assembly gathers to worship, opening the Bible and saying, thus says the Lord. You need that. So honor them. Highly honor them. Highly esteem them with love, with double honor. Obey, submit, and recognize because they are doing a job that is irreplaceable and unable to be substituted in any other way in the Christian life. You need a shepherd and Christ has made it so. That's the word of God. So why should you recognize? Why should you submit? Why should you have to obey? Why should you have to highly esteem and honor? Because they're doing an incomparably important job. They are doing everything they can to make sure that at the end of it all, you get to heaven. And I want to say this very clearly. If it's that important to you, then you better have an expert. Because this is a tremendously frightening thing to be wrong about. If heaven or hell are in the balance, and Paul has clearly stated to Timothy that heaven and hell are indeed in the balance, there are thousands, nay, millions of people around the world right now on this Sunday that are in churches where preachers are espousing heresy. And the pew sitter has no idea that they are willingly imbibing poison. Or just as bad, he stands up and he preaches truth, but he lives in sin, in addiction, in rebellion. You heard the statistics I mentioned to you just last week. Pastors addicted to pornography. Sexual liaisons with women in their church that are not their wife. It's rampant in the church. So you had better be duly sure that who stands before you week after week, not only talks this talk, but walks this walk, opens the word and lives the word in the honor of Christ as the head of his church. Heaven and hell are in the balance. So that's why you should honor them. That's why you should recognize them. That's why you should highly esteem them in love. The next thing that we read in our text, you should honor, submit, obey all these things because they don't answer to you. Well, that's a it's quite jarring, isn't it? You know, the, the text said, uh, they keep watch over your soul as those who will have to give an account. 
And some of you, no one here, but, but someone may have thought to themselves, well, well, that's right, they will. And I can't wait for the next business meeting to make him give an account. Uh, no, actually, <laughs> they don't answer to you. They answer to someone vastly more frightening than you. The infinite, almighty, omniscient God is who they answer to. And so you should highly esteem them because you wouldn't want to be them. I didn't mean to rap. It just came out. It comes out sometimes. <laughs> Have it in me, and it's a gift. They answer to the greatest power of all. They answer to God. The next reason why you should honor, serve, submit is they don't get a choice in giving an account. I'm not going to opt out on Judgment Day. I've, I've pastored a few churches before in my time. I know I look a lot older than what I really am. It's all the gray. That's ministry, I can assure you. Every single flock that I've stood as shepherd, God will say, Craig, where are my sheep? I'm not going to be able to say, God, you see this, <laughs> this oak grove, real piece of work. Um, <clears throat> Nothing like a church I've pastored before, just a real ragtag bunch of people. And I just, you know what, God, I, I tried, but I think you're going to want to go look for them yourself. I don't know where they are. You know, you know what it says? It says that those that stand as shepherds of the flock of Christ, under shepherds, elders, leaders, pastors, preachers, they don't get a choice if they want to give this account or not. There's no shortcuts. There's no easy ways out. This is it. It is a real a real epidemic in ministry today, particularly in the West, where we know in the U.S. alone, 4,000 churches a year shut their doors for good. And the average lifespan of a pastor in churches is increasingly low, somewhere in the vicinity of three to five years. And then they say, this job is not for me. I'm out. We, we, we live in a day where this is not an easy thing to do. But God has called us to give an account. And the most frightening aspect of it all, there are, there are pastors that I know of who are trying to find a way to sabotage their ministry because they don't have the courage to just quit so they go and have an affair. But they'll do anything to get out. The gifts, the callings of God are without repentance. They're irrevocable. Once called to serve and stand as God's mouthpiece before God's people, that account that preachers, leaders, pastors are called to give is secure, set in stone, and irrevocable. So please, honor them, obey them, submit to them. They have it harder than you can imagine. And next, we read in the text, Hebrews tells us this, it says... It says if they can do this with joy, if they can do this job, this calling, if they can do it with joy, that will be of great advantage to you. So, so understand this firstly, what we learn from this passage is you have the power within yourself to make this job joyous. You have that. You have that ability. D don't say, I, I, don't really, I don't really care if my elders are happy in their job. It's not on me. It's, it's not up to me. What well, the Bible says it is, in fact, quite up to you. And then it says this, not only, not only do you have the power within yourself to make the pastor's life, the preacher's life, the leader's and elder's lives a joy, not only do you have that power within yourself, it says you ought to pursue doing that because that'll be a great advantage to you. And if they have to do their job with grief, the, the Greek word here is, it, it's tricky. Let's go back here to verse 17. I want to show you this in the text. The second portion of the verse says, let them do this with joy and not with groaning. It's kind of a challenging word. The, the, real, the real underlying Greek word is kind of grief. Like grief at a loss or, or grief through the pain of something happened in your life. But probably the, the emphasis that the author is trying to draw out here is the word reluctance and resentment. Resentment. Do you get a sense of that? Make sure that your leaders are serving without resenting you for it. 
right? So when your name shows up on their phone, they're not like, what is it now? I saw this silly picture on social media. No preacher should ever do this. Stop and say, I saw a picture on social media, but here we go. And it was this, this picture of this pastor. Was, uh, the picture made it look like it was a pastor. And standing there with his laptop and a big cheesy grin and a cup of steaming hot coffee to the side. And, and, and the caption said, oh, an email from one of my church members. It's probably a testimony or a word of encouragement. <laughs> it never is. <laughs> it never is. It's a complaint. It's moaning, groaning, upset, disappointed. You need to make sure, according to Scripture that your elders and leaders and pastors and preachers are doing their job with joy because you know who suffers most if they don't. It's not them, it's you. That's what the Bible says. That's what your Bible said to you. I'm out of the loop on this. It says that you need to make sure that your leaders are loving their experience in doing their work. Yes, some days are rough. Yes, experiences are rough. Yes, pastors have to have to be there at the worst times in your life and have to hear the confessions of the most horrid, grotesque sins. If I could stand up here once, I would never do this, but if I could stand up here one Sunday morning and list the top 10 worst confessions that I've ever had to sit and listen to, you would vomit in your seat. I carry that around 24-7. That's the burden of this job. And I am called to it, and I love it, but it's on you to ensure that there is no groaning, says the ESV. There's, there's no grief. There's no resentment. There's, there, there's no moment where there's a reluctance because although the preacher will suffer, don't get me wrong, if you're, if you're out to pay him back for what he said to you, what he did to you, how he forgot your name, how he didn't send you the birthday greeting card, if you're out to get him back, the Bible says the person that suffers most will always be you. Always. Because the job that he's trying to do for your soul has life or death heaven or hell, in the balance. Word to the wise. Word to the wise. Do not, this is not related to anything I've said so far this morning. This is just a tidbit. You can take this home with you. Unrelated, okay? Do not, do not go out of your way to peeve off your brain surgeon before brain surgery. Is that, can I say peeve off? I, you know, I hesitated because I don't know if that's a cuss word here. In Australia, it's fine. I get away with a lot of stuff saying that. <laughs> Never go out of your way to peeve off your brain surgeon before brain surgery. It's, that's not related to anything I've said so far. I just want you to know that for your sake. Make sure your leaders are loving their role as your leaders. Because if you do, the harvest of benefit, fruitfulness, and favor in your life will be uncontainable. But if you're going out of your way to be slanderous, to pass on gossip, to make accusations, to be the devil's advocate, if you're going out of your way to make his life hard by moaning, groaning, complaining, and whining, and gathering a whole group of people to join you in your pity party, you have inflicted great harm on yourself. So says God in the Scripture. Your leaders are those who spoke the word. Their faith is imitable. The outcome of their life is enviable. Why should you obey, submit, and honor, and respect? Because they're keeping watch over your souls. Because they'll give an account. And because it's no advantage to you if they're doing their job joylessly. The next question that arises, I've got enough content here for three weeks, but let's try and finish this off. How do they keep watch over your souls? You know, what, is, what does that look like? How do they do that? What's, that? what's that function? Now, this is important. And this is where we find that those who minister as pastors and preachers and leaders have the greatest amount of conflict in local churches because there are unspoken or unwritten expectations that are assumed and in the end, offense is caused. So I feel like at this point, as we're looking at this text, they, they keep watch over your souls, that it would do us no harm this morning to ask the question, how do they keep watch over your souls? In other words, what functions, 
What responsibilities should they have as primary? And so we go to the Word of God, if you'll turn with me in the book of Acts. We're going to be in two places in Acts, chapter 6, and then, as I mentioned earlier, chapter 20. So let's start at Acts chapter 6. We're closing out. We're we're finding a place to land this. We'll get you out real soon here. Acts chapter 6, verse 4. Uh, Sorry, let's start at verse, let's go verse 4 and then verse 6 and 7. Three verses. Now, let me build some context real quick. You know what happens here in this situation. The church of Jerusalem is in a state of revival. And more than one ethnicity is getting saved. Praise God. The church should reflect as a microcosm the multi-ethnicity and diversity of the community that the church is in. That was a more important statement than what you may have realized, but there I said it. So in Jerusalem, we see that not only Hebrew Jews are being saved, but Hellenistic Jews, that is, that is people who come to their Jewish faith through Greek roots or by living in Greek centers or having the Koine Greek as their main language. And in this church of Jerusalem, in a state of revival, an upheaval occurs over racism, So this is a really serious situation. This is a big deal. This is the first churches, one of their first really big tests, how they will handle a situation of racism, where one ethnicity is seeking to ostracize another ethnicity on the basis of nothing other than their difference of ethnicity. That is the definition of racism. It's happening in the church. Now, it's happening, not only racism in the church is a horrible thing that should be resisted at any cost. Yes, absolutely. But it's happening to the widows, the most vulnerable of all the church members, are the widows. So they're starving to death because they're being excluded from the daily distribution of food and sustenance. So what do the apostles do? What do the apostles do in Acts chapter 6? What's their measure? What's their remedy? Now, some of you, the way you think about church leadership, the way you think church leadership should happen, if you had never read this story before and you didn't know the outcome of this story, you would have the apostles themselves standing there at the tables, taking responsibility and distributing the food. You would assume that's what they should do. And I, I know that because I've served here as pastor now, coming on... Goodness, I don't know, two years, must be close enough, one and a half, two years. And I know there are some expectations of people here in this church that I serve you food. I recognize that. So as we come to this story, we see the, we see the way the leaders respond to this problem. They appoint servants, the diaconate, as it's spoken of in Acts 6. And then it says this in verse 4. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. Verse 6 says, These, the deacons they appointed, set before the apostles, prayed over them, laid their hands on them. Verse 7, And the word of God continued to increase. The numbers of disciples multiplied greatly. What a staggering way to handle this concern. While there are often unspoken, unwritten expectations on what the pastor needs to do, where he needs to be, what time he needs to be there, how he needs to serve the food, you need to realize that according to the New Testament, the things that your pastor needs to be doing more and above everything else is prayer and study the Word. Even if the church is in a chaos of racial tension, Even if widows are being disregarded and abused and are starving to death, I cannot give up praying and preparing the word because souls are at stake. That's how they keep watch over your soul. Now, I know you have other ideas, and I appreciate and respect that, but I'm going to do the best thing for you that God tells me to do to pray and to preach and study and know the Word. And I hope that that's reflected every time I stand up here to deliver God's Word to you. That you know that you will get what you ask for. There are are churches out there, again, not this one, other churches that we don't know, where the pastor is required to do everything. He's required to wash the dishes after the fellowship lunch. He's required to go around and mow the lawns of all the widows. He's he's, he's required to to be there on all the moving days and serve everybody and do everything. That's not the way the New Testament says that the pastor keeps watch of your souls. 
That good on him if he's got time and energy to serve, that's fine. But if he ever does that at the expense of praying for his flock and preparing the word and study for his flock, then that pastor will never experience the words of this text and the word of God increased and the number of disciples multiply greatly. If you want that, i.e. revival, if you want that, then free up your minister to do nothing more than prayer and study the word you want that revival how do they keep watch over your souls there it is acts 20 we're gonna we're gonna finish this acts 20 verse 28 to 32 let's read these passages together these few verses we spoke about this earlier paul says this to the ephesian church elders acts 20 verse 28 through to 32 pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the holy spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. Know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. Now I commend you to God, to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. It's another way that your minister, your leaders keep watch over your souls. They are alert to fierce soul destroying wolves. They are alert to it. They have the gift and spirit of discernment to know it, to be aware of it, to know the word of God sufficiently to counteract it. Keep watch. Because fierce wolves are constantly trying to get inside this church and every church that names the name of Christ. Fierce wolves are constantly trying to encroach and not spare the flock and destroy lives, families and souls and send people to hell. That's why you ought to have a leader or leaders who know the Bible well enough to withstand any onslaught of the enemy. And of course, the text we read earlier, 1 Timothy 4.16, take heed to yourself and to the doctrine, continue in them, for in doing so, you'll save yourself and those who hear you. This is the main obligation, the main responsibility of any man that stands and desires the office of a bishop, an overseer, an elder, is that they would keep watch of their knowledge of the word, the way they teach the word, the way they live the word, and the holiness with which they pursue. Let me make it really simple. I'll close with this. I'll break this really down. Let's, let's boil this down. Leaders, lead as those who will give an account, keeping watch over your souls and those you shepherd. And saints, make their leadership a joy. Honor, respect, and obey. Why? Because they'll do a much better job at it if they're doing it with joy. Bow your head, close your eyes. Let's look to close out here with a word of prayer to God's goodness and God's glorious grace. Father, we thank you for your presence here this morning. We thank you for your word. God, you know how much I personally recoil from speaking like this or preaching like this because I am just so aware, God, how much of this looks like I'm feathering my nest, how much of this looks like I'm trying to build myself up or edify myself, God, but you know my heart. You know where I'm coming from. You know I do this for the good of the people. That we would know the word, live the word, love the word, and we would see souls saved. Revival hit this church, this city. And we thank you, Lord God, for your grace and your spirit of promise. That you help us to be safe and secure in the church of God, which is the pillar and the buttress of truth. Help us to honor, to revere, to highly esteem our leaders. Help us to recognize them as leaders. And to devote ourselves to seeing that they lead with joy. Because we know that's the best thing for us. Help us, God, to know that our leaders will give an account. A terrifying moment where they will be judged based upon how faithful they were in the word and in the conduct of their life. I pray, Lord God, let your spirit speak through your word. That it might save us and change us and help us and heal us. In Jesus' name, amen. 